Hi guys, how's it going? My name is Joshua Halter. I am the owner and founder of The BioDude and with me today... Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm the wholesale representative for The BioDude. And today we're actually really excited. We have a, a beautiful acrylic aquarium in front of us and we are at the Houston Museum of Science. It is a one-of-a-kind place here and Becca and I are really excited because we are doing an overhaul today. Becca, be tell awesome. us a little bit about what we're doing. Yeah, so we have uh, the dart frog tank. Stephanie reached out because they needed some help, and we are the OGs in Bioactive. So what we're going to be doing today is completely redoing their tank so that it is self-sufficient, self-sustaining, and they never have to do anything else. And it's beautiful for the dart frogs that are going to go into it. Now, I love this tank because this is one of those custom-made enclosures. So not only is this really thick acrylic, we actually had to do a little bit of work to have it be functional to work with dart frogs. So if you guys can see here in the front, there is three big bulkheads installed. We actually had to take out the original bulkheads that were in here because they were cemented in place. It actually took us a couple trips up here to actually get it done, but then uh, Tiffany was the, the, the golden chamber with that. Um, we actually have it set so that way it's as simple as turning a knob and all the water from the drainage layer will drain out immediately. Um, and that's going to play a major role with the soil, the soil health, sustainability, while making sure we are harboring positive bacteria, not negative ones for the frogs. Um, but we're really excited about this because you guys have had these frogs for a while, and the tank looked nice before. But we're gonna, we're gonna, gonna do, get we're gonna, today. yeah, we're gonna do what, uh, what we do. So, do you want to get building? Yeah, let's okay. get started. Get started. Cool. So. Uh, I guess what I'm going to be starting with is the is is our drainage layer. So I'm going to start go ahead and uh, putting that into the enclosure. So this is our Hydrogrow V2. We have two types of Hydrogrow. This one is a little bit better for dart frogs because, as you see, they're lava rocks. So it's going to help give you a better um, water level of retention. You got it. <laughs> We're working with some odd spaces today, but we'll so, get Becca, it. So, Becca, when we do the drainage layer, can it be uneven all over the place? Do we want it to be kind of consecutive all around? Tell us a little bit about you that. You definitely want to try to get it as even as possible, especially when you have a drainage layer that is more of a porous type in rock. You're going to get um, better surface tension if it's even, and that's where your screen dividers will come into play too, because once you level it out, you'll put your screen divider on top, and it'll help create a stable layer. All right, so oh, this is going to be so much fun getting these large pieces of branches in here. So we're distributing a good four, the three, a, a four to three inch layer in here, which uh, we're trying to keep it even across the board just to make it easy. And I, I'm a little low on this side, so I'm going to get this to be. So, Becca, when we're dealing with um, draining it, if they don't have a bulkhead in here, tell us a little bit about how we drain this drainage layer without the bulkhead, or with the bulkhead. Are you talking about the one that we installed? Yes. So, it's going to be very simple. If it is to ever overflow, you're literally just going to open up the valve. It'll drain out, and then you can close it up so that you don't have a water um, pool laying up. Because if you did, you can have a overgrowth of anaerobic bacteria, which can cause a lot of harm to the environment itself. So next, what I have right here is a screen divider. So this is just normal window screen that you can get at the hardware store, but we sell it at the BioDude pre-cut and good to go. Um, Becca, why do we need to use this in regards to the HydroGrow version two? So especially with this one, since most frogs will not burrow and you'll never get that there. If on the odd chance they would decide to go down, the screen layer is what's going to protect them, but it also gives you a variant level. So if your substrate was to ever overflow and you needed to get rid of it or do things with it, it would become a lot easier to actually handle with this screen layer itself. Especially when you have a rocky type layer versus a, um, our HydroGrow one where it's going to create a much even more surface layer, this will help your soil not fall down into it. Yeah, because what we don't want is for the soil to get mixed up uh, with your drainage layer. Because that's what Becca was saying, that's when you can start having your issues with bad bacterial growth, have your issues with improper water retention, as well as some other issues that will come to light. Um, and when you're using a drainage, when you're using a drainage screen, 
you want to make sure that you know your screen is as uh, even with the rest of your drainage layer as you can possibly make it. There's going to be a little bit of sections that a little bit of it might might not be hitting it when it comes to a special type of enclosure like this, but that's okay. We're going to use enough flora in here to make sure that uh, that we are okay. So I want to come around here. A little heavy on this side, but that's okay. Great. So we got our drainage layer in. Next is the soil. So Josh is using our Terraflora blend. Terraflora is specifically designed for rainforest type environments as tree frogs, stumpy tree frogs. So it's gonna hold that humidity range in which you need. And for your dart frogs, you need a very high humidity of like 85 to 100% almost. So the floor works really well because it allows it to drain really easily so you don't get over waterlogged in there. Yep. And I got a good amount of water inside this one. There's gonna be some dry portions that I'm gonna evenly distribute once I, you know, get the rest of the substrate put in here. So you can see that the floor is a pretty chunky mix, but it's not chunky like ABG. Tell me a little bit, Becca, how does it function? So the way the TerraFloor function is it's gonna allow all the water to drain through it appropriately. So as all that misting system is going in, it's going to let it drain out so that it doesn't get over waterlogged, your plants don't get um, soggy rooted and root rotted. And it's gonna allow the moisture pockets to come up throughout the day so that your animals have those bursts of humidity that they need. That's right, all right. The chunky components allow it for aeration, so you don't have compaction, and it's awesome for your frogs. And that is really important because one of the biggest killers of amphibians is soil that retains too much mixture. Or too much mixture retains too much water, excuse me. All right. Last but not least. So it looks like we're using a ton of substrate, which we are but we're gonna be covering our bases really well. I gotta remove my ring so it doesn't get lost in the... There we go. Uh, so the hope is that not only is this substrate gonna provide different levels of like, for hiding spaces on the ground, opportunities for different types of plants to grow, but also make your job as a keeper a lot easier. And, and you guys, close up, you know, you guys can see it's a pretty nice, hearty, chunky mix. Put my foot in, put my finger in here. We have about three and a half inches depth of substrate, which is ideally what I'm gonna want. So Becca, as we add water in here, what's gonna happen as the water passes through the substrate? You're gonna start to see what's called a rainbow effect. So typically in an enclosure um, with this type of substrate, it's gonna be all kind of the same color since it's such a humid environment, but you'll see it draining through. So if you ever have an enclosure that is not doing too well, you can take a look at your soil to see how it looks. So typically you should see a drier portion on the top, a darker portion in the middle and darkest on the bottom. But when it comes to TerraFlora, you're gonna see a little bit more darker in general just because of how wet the environment is. And this is our spag moss that he is mixing in right now. Sphagnum moss helps to hold in humidity without overwatering your substrate because this will hold on to the humidity, the water, and then release it throughout the day. As well as help with air rate. Oh, you said to help with air rating. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a biodegradable. And, yep, and it does break down very slow as well, which is helpful for your micro populations in here of your cleanup crews. And when keeping poison dart frogs, you must have an, a very healthy and hardy springtail population. Why is that, Becca? Dart frogs are one of the only frogs that is are going to constantly eat your cleanup crew because they use springtails as a secondary food source. So you will be constantly adding in those springtails for a cleanup, but you will also be adding them in as their actual food. And they will decimate it because they are fatties. Mixed up in here. I like this. We got a nice even layer throughout. Looks good. Okay. All right. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add in some of our Bioshock. 
So this is our BioShot. BioShot is a combination of beneficial bacteria and fungal systems such as mycorrhizae. And what it does is it acts as a um, starter for your breakdown process and it's gonna create a symbiotic relationship with your plants. So whenever your cleanup crew breaks down the waste of the animal, the waste that your isopod produced, your cleanup crew, your BioShot is going to break that down to feed your plants. So it turns into a whole ecosystem inside of itself. Yep, and it's all about having everything work for each other. Exactly. Uh, the springtails and isopods as a back end, they're gonna create nitrogen. Nitrogen is then transfixed by plant roots and then materialized into the things that the plants need. Um, whereas your different biological processes that the BioShot puts in provides extra nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus as well as, you know, like Becca said, your different strains of mycorrhizae to help jumpstart your plants as well as reinforce those already existing and introduced processes that are super important to nature. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a look and something I want you guys to kind of see, you notice how up here I left the drainage layer to be a little bit higher and then on this side it's a little bit lower. So it, once the water level literally reaches the top of this stand, that's gonna be the museum's cue to be like, hey, let's turn on the bulkhead, drain out the excess water, helps make it foolproof. That's what we're trying to do. Make it be as easy and ex ex accessible as possible. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna dump in a little bit of water. There we go. The water is very important in the beginning process to get your moisture levels established. If not, you can have some problems with your plants getting established. Yep, and it also helps prevent the shock of your roots from your plants. Because you and I both know, when you put plants in a new environment, what comes with it? A lot of trauma to those roots. So they will, um, a lot of the times, kind of start to break down if you just kind of bare root them and put them in there very drastically. So if you have a proper environment for them to go into, kind of feel like home, you have a better chance. So I neglected to mention this. In the very middle, they have a beautiful universal rock stump that's attached. At the very top, we have some Spanish moss. So we're gonna be watching the Spanish moss really close just to make sure that it doesn't get too humid, that it starts breaking down and becoming that, that that scratchy um, type of moss, but with how well that this tank aerates should not be a problem whatsoever. So now we got our substrate in, we're gonna add the bugs last, just because um, I wanna get everything set up. So I think what comes next is figuring out what our hardscape's gonna be. So since these are terrestrial frogs, it's gonna be really important that I give them areas to hide on the floor as well as areas to climb. So we have some ghost wood. This is really great for wetter environments because ghost wood is a dry wood, so it's not gonna mold up as easily as something as like grapewood wood. So right now, I'm creating areas that these critters can hide, like go into and hide, but at the same time feel, feel like they have different places to create territories, different areas to climb, as well as create opportunities. So I love cork bark flats like this because it allows me to create essentially pre-built caves and burrows. And I, I, I'm gonna show you guys how I do that. What, what I like to do is I'll take a flat like this. Oh, and then I'm gonna dig like this. I'm gonna put this bad boy right here. And then I'm gonna take this, boom, little cave. And then that's gonna go with kind of the rest of the that I got going on here. Bing, 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 I need back there. Same principle. I'm gonna kind of put this up here like this. Then I have this really awesome right here. And we're gonna cover it up like this. So the most important thing with this enclosure is that I do not obstruct their ability to take care of the animals, which means that this hole and that hole back there must be readily accessible. And what's nice is I'll be able to take a small screw and I can screw this right in the background and you're never gonna know that it's even attached. Then we have my favorite. Ghostwood. Yeah. So this stuff's actually harvested out of California. 
um, and then they take, it's actually, it's called manzanita. Um, and then what they do, they take it to a sandblaster and they sandblast to give it this neat, unique, naked look to it, hence the ghost aspect to it. So when it comes to plants and dart frogs, you wanna look for plants that are able to handle pretty much almost water submergible, um, but you also want plants that are gonna provide you with a lot of coverage and sturdiness. Um, so we have a lot of brom, bromads, those are perfect for dart frogs. Bromeliads. Look at how beautiful They're these are. They're super pretty. They're gonna be awesome. Pops of this. color in the enclosure. All these offsets. You want to bare root your plants as much as possible before putting them into the enclosures. All of our plants are completely natural and organic, so they're ready for bioactive enclosures. However, we don't use any pesticides or chemicals on them, so there's always the chance of like a hitchhiker. So as you get off as much soil as possible, you eliminate that from the tank. I love pieces like this because they provide wonderful opportunities for shoving plants into them. Especially plants that can grow epiphytically, which means they grow above the trees. And plants that need a lot of drainage. There's nothing underneath them, it's just gonna go down. So we'll see what I can get going here. Okay, so next we got a lot of smaller plants and I got some more offset bromeliads. Now, these are just like the other ones, okay, that, that we put in there, but as the plants grow, they shoot out what are called pups. So these are the pups. So we have a lot of different kinds, all shapes, all, co all shapes, colors, all neo regalia. Before I do those, because these, these are my finishing touching pieces, we have the beautiful, beautiful, uh, fern. I want to say the this southern isn't, shield. It's really tough with ferns because their root systems are so tiny and complex. So I'm going to just kind of show you guys what I'm talking about here. So this is a calathea. So you guys can see here, you see how their roots are a lot bigger, you know, a little bit more intricate kind of. This was almost uh, bound in the pot. Then you see the ferns. Very, very small, significantly smaller than the rest of them. So when I'm going and planting these, I have to be really attentive with how I remove the dirt um, to make sure not to damage any of their complex root systems. We have some pothos right here. These are called, uh, uh, th this is a uh, neon green pothos. You can keep this plant in your closet for a month and it will still survive. Becca, tell us a little bit, what precautions do we have to take when planting things like this to ensure that you're not setting yourself up for failure. You wanna make sure that your roots are still able to expand and grow and absorb water. So if you put it in an area that's never going to get any of that, you're gonna have a failure to thrive. And while you'll have a pretty plant for a couple of weeks, she will die out on eventually. You also wanna make sure it's never too close to your plant lights that you have above because it will give it a burn and you'll start to see that on the edges of the plants themselves. These are Swiss cheese philodendrons. These are super, super cool. And they're gonna add a really cool waterfall effect to the enclosure. Okay, so you guys saw the rattlesnake calathea. Then we have, it's called a hypoestes splash. It looks a lot like a photonia, but this plant is kind of like a pothos. You can literally grow it in anything. Um, and just to kind of put into example, we've had this plant for about 40 days in our greenhouse and it's already starting to become ready to be moved out of this pot. There's one more thing aspect that we're missing and that is a height aspect here and here. I'm thinking, which one? Over here? So. This one? what I was thinking too. So water dish, we have a couple options. We can have a water dish literally in front of each of the, of the doors. So open it up, pull it, put it back in, makes it really easy. Now it's figuring out these bad boys and how I want to utilize them and where I want to put them. For me, these miniature offsets, they're always an opportunity to tie the room together is how I like to put it. 
Next, we have a lot of accents. I am all about accents. We have natural sponge lichen, okay? So you guys see this out in the woods, normally in the Pacific Northwest. We have these things called, these different seed pods called bell pods, okay? And what's nice about these is they hold water. Becca, Becca will get into that. We have a monkey pod and we have ram's head pods. These are all natural seed pods from around planet Earth each having their own unique function when it comes to the forest floor. Becca, tell us a little bit about why nut pods are an integral part to a, bio, to a bioactive terrarium. So not only are they like adding a decorative pillow to your couch, it's gonna add a nice fairy touch, but they provide opportunities. So that bell pod and those monkey pods are actually able to be used as water um, opportunities. And the spring tails are going to constantly be in those areas. So they'll reproduce very easily, especially with that ram's head, I find they just, Love it. So it gives you a better opportunity for your frogs. They can hang out in there. And if you're trying to breed dart frogs, sometimes they'll go in there as those bell pods and use those as their homes. So leaf litter is very, very essential to the process. If you do not have biodegradables in your enclosure itself, the dirt will start to break down on itself and then you get a very fine dirt and it will not function in the way that it is designed. No, it will not. So biodegradables in a tropical environment have about a two to three-ish month down breakdown process. So just like outside when you see the leaves fall, you come back two weeks later, the same thing's happening in your tank. So you need to constantly replenish those biodegradables. And look at this sheet moss. It is nice. That is nice. <laughs> How much? And this is natural sheet moss. This yeah, is this not is dyed. Natural, A lot of the like stuff that you'll Louisiana. see in store is uh, dyed sphagnum moss and it's dyed green and it can leach into your enclosure. But this is completely natural and harvested from local states. And this sheet moss will eventually attach to where he's placing it. So as long as the keepers here give it a good misting, but that misting system is gonna be set up, it should flourish. So we have a hot glue gun. Um, hot glue and then 100% silicone is what you would be using to kind of mount things into your enclosures. If you're going to use 100% proof um, silicone, you're going to need to let your enclosure air out for a minimum of 24 hours after the fact, because it has a really strong chemical cell. So for these kinds of tanks, you actually do need very high plant levels of lighting, such as LED lighting, because of the amount of photosynthesis that needs to go on in here. And when it comes to making sure your plants are getting what they need, what are some of the signs that the general keeper should look for that their plants aren't doing so hot? So browning on your leaves is a big one. Um, yelloration in the colors. So if you see like your plants are starting to turn yellows around the edges or even towards the middle, it can be an indication that either your soil function isn't working appropriately or your lighting isn't going through. Um, and we are always there to help. So if you ever have questions on your plants, you can always email us at our customer care team and they can help you out. So while these lights do produce heat, they're not, it's not producing heat down in the tank. Dart frogs do not require heat systems. They are actually much better attempt to room temperature. So dart frogs need to have a bunch of leaf litter. Why is that? It is going to be for production of springtails as well as hiding in that aeration process. So they want to feel as hidden as possible and as secure as possible because they know that they are very small and they are low on the food chain. So if they feel hidden, then they will feel secure. What's really nice about this leaf litter, as Becca was saying, is that since darts rely on the springtails as a food source, what is something that the springtails are continually swarming? They are continuously swarming your biodegradables. So especially in environments with dart frogs, where you have an overproduction of springtails, you're uh, biodegradables are going to break down at a little bit of a faster rate. So you need to add in more things like isopod paperback bark, sycamore paperback bark, cork, and all of these kinds of things are going to be what your springtails feast on when there's not enough waste. There we go. Mm -hmm. Like we said in the beginning, giving it that good watering in the beginning is very, very crucial to get those moisture levels established in the lower levels. So when your plants are going to take root, they actually have something to drink. <laughs> I know that was a little aggressive. <laughs> so all that's left now is for us to put in the springtails, the isopods, which we're gonna be doing here a little bit later after I get this tank, get it settled and established. Now we're just watering. 
So as I'm going through, I'm making sure that all the bromeliads have fresh water in their axles. So Becca, when it comes to letting your bioactive terrarium maintain, what's the general acceptable length of time for dart frogs to let it sit so your springtail populations can maintain or get established? Minimum three weeks to a month. So you actually have a broom of reproduction in there because if you were to place your darts right in after you place those springtails in and expect a reproduction, that is a false reality. Um, they will just completely eat them. So you will be constantly reproducing them. So if you get that big boom, because the way springtails reproduce is they'll die off, have a big boom, die off, have a big boom. So you really need that in there already going before you put in those hungry, hungry hippos. So what we have to watch, not problematic areas, but the pofos that's mounted up here and the philodendron that's mounted up here, we will likely have to make sure that the, when the Mist King does its job, that it's hitting those plants directly. Um, mainly just because they are gonna dry out five times faster than anything else in here. We have lots of space for water bowls. We have bowl in the back, bowl in the back. We can Then we have all these other opportunity zones with the bromeliads and the nut pods. Overall, I'd say it's turned out pretty good. It looks great. So I have a Mist King in front of me. This is one of the most innovative products that hit our industry a while ago. Um, you can use it for almost any application. For this, we're using it for our terrariums. So what's really nice in here, we have two dual nozzles. So this terrarium is gonna have a total of four nozzles in it. We are going to play with the nozzles and we're going to see um, if four is going to be acceptable for us. Um, and we're gonna be connecting them with this black tubing here, okay? Um, we have some tubing extra. It's just you don't typically wanna use clear because clear can harbor like bacteria and stuff. Um, and inside, it comes with your instructions. The double T's do not come with it. Those are additions that we brought specifically yes, for this you. tank. Okay, you got a seconds timer, which Becca's gonna set up and show you guys how to do that because she's so good at it. And then we got a really nice single nozzle. So these were additional. When you buy the whole misting kit, this is what comes with it, as well as assorted bulkheads and other things for your um, uh, reservoir. We have the power adapter. And then we have our hydroponic pump. So this pump, is the same type of pump that you can get to grow your plants at a hydroponic store. It's just branded with the misking. It's great, great, great pump. Okay, so, and this takes the quarter inch tubing. So, um, essentially what I'm gonna do is first I'm gonna look at, so it goes here, here, and then we got our nozzles. So we know that these two T nozzles are gonna be connected together. And then we're gonna end it with this nozzle right here, which means we're gonna need what is called a reducing elbow. This is this bad boy right here. Okay, so we're gonna take the reducer, plug it right back into there. I'm gonna have to take them off anyway. Then, we have our lids right here. So these are their really nice custom lids that they have. Um, so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm going to be drilling. I'm gonna be where one of these existing holes is. I'm gonna make the hole a little bit bigger to be able to fit the bulkhead nice and in here. Put the bulkhead in, plug in the tubing, and then I'm gonna be facing the nozzles this way. So when it sprays, it's not spraying on the glass. It's spraying towards the plants. And that's gonna be a big deal. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, work on getting that together. So I guess first thing, can I just see if that, oh, if, if only the gods were that kind, okay. We're almost there. So 
So then snapped in place, remove the covers, then the T bulkhead of my pocket. Oh yeah. Okay, so this is the right side of the top. Really nice acrylic drilled. We were lucky enough that a fan was already installed. This fan's gonna be running the whole time. Um, and then we have I uh, drilled in the uh, bulkhead and attached the Miss King nozzles. So now what we're gonna do is get this set up and then we're gonna do a dry run of the Miss King and make sure it's working the way that we need it to. Oh yeah, this down, this down like this. Click in here. So essentially I'm taking the tubing. I connected it into right here at this top. So the water from the pump is gonna come into here. It's gonna go into these, transfer over here, and then end right here. You notice I have all the misters pointing down. I did that for a reason. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this tubing right here, and this is what's gonna go into the reservoir. Or, excuse me, it's gonna go into the pump and then from the pump to the reservoir. So, I guess the next thing is we gotta figure out, well, where do we wanna put the actual misting unit? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the tubing, plug it right into the top right here like this to make sure it's secure. So it's snapped into place. The line ends here at this elbow. Water's gonna travel here, here, from this into here, and then from here into the reservoir. So you notice how the flow is this way. So what that means is that the way to the pump is going this way. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna cut it, and most important is putting this, make sure it's in there so it doesn't leak, done. Then you're gonna take this, make sure it snaps in, and you put this right into, the, into your water. You wanna make sure that it's there at the bottom, now I'm gonna test it. Okay, there we go, there we go. We're in, misting down, misting down. Misting over, misting over and misting down. Do we cover all of our bases? Yes, we do. We are gonna let this bad boy run for two minutes a day. Two minutes a day, two and a half minutes a day, really depends on what you're noticing with your humidity ranges, okay? Um, but I'm gonna let this thing run for probably about four minutes, um, just so that way we can get everything really saturated and everything good to go. Um, like with any other system, it's a misting system, so you cannot use bad water. When I say bad water, tap water, hard water, the minerals, calcium, and all the stuff in there will ruin these nozzles within a month. But I think we're all set up. Um, I really wanna thank the museum uh, for an awesome opportunity for Becca and I. Um, I had so much fun building this and I really hope y'all's inhabitants like it. Um, yeah, it turned out great. Uh, make sure you guys visit my website, uh, biodo.com. Go to my store Monday through Friday and Saturday. Um, hit, you know, follow us on YouTube and Instagram, all that good stuff. Due to bides. So these are our isopods and our springtails that we're gonna be adding into the dart frogs enclosures to make it truly bioactive. To be bioactive, you need two micros. You need your microflora and your microfauna. The microflora is the bio shot that we added. And this is gonna be our microfauna aspect. So these are dwarf purple isopods. I'm trying to see. They have dwarf name for a reason because they're super tiny. So we're not gonna be able to see them today. 
Um, but what these do is these aid in the cleanup crew aspect. So any waste that the animals produce in the enclosure are gonna be broken down by our isopods and our springtails and put back into the enclosure for the plants to break down to eat in simple sugars. And these springtails are super, super important when it comes to dart frogs because these are gonna be their secondary food source. And if you can see here, these are these little white crawly jumpy bugs. So like I was saying, dart frogs are one of the frogs that you are going to have to constantly replace your springtails. But once we add these into the enclosure, it'll be ready to go and fully bioactive. So we added in all of our isopods and springtails now so that it is a truly self-sustaining bioactive enclosure. Your isopods and springtails are going to take a little bit to start reproducing so you should see that in about three to four weeks. Um, your springtails will come in large booms and die out so you'll see them flourishing. You're going to see a lot of them in these nut pods that we've added so those are going to be really great breeding grounds for all of the isopods so that they do not have to go ahead and, and clean the enclosures anymore. It'll do it for it. So any of the waste produced by the animals is gonna be broken down into the actual enclosure and able to feed the plants and it'll turn into a whole system. It's really awesome to watch and it's gonna be really fun for the whole museum to be able to experience something like this. Hi, I'm Stephanie, one of the animal caretakers here at the museum and uh, we just came back from putting the dart frogs in here. So it's been about three weeks or so since the bio dude came and greeted our whole tank, which is fantastic and we love it. So the reason why we had them come and redo the tank was because the dart frogs needed a little extra space to move around and hide in because if the frogs feel like they have more places to hide, then they do feel more secure and they will come out a little bit more so everybody will get a chance to see them. Plus this is an exhibit tank, so we wanted it done as professionally as possible. So we really appreciate what BioDude did for our dart frog tank. So we have about five frogs in here now. So we have a couple blues, a bumblebee, um, some green ones in there, plus a brand new one that's never actually been on exhibit. Uh, he's our emerald frog. Um, and you may or may not hear him calling because he hears me, he recognizes me, but I'm not in there feeding him yet. So uh, they're wondering where their food is. But uh, so we do have several species of dart frogs and each of them are indicated by a different color. So each species does have a different level of toxicity in them. Some dart frogs, if you ingest that toxin, um, can give you mild stomach cramps, whereas some of them, uh, like the golden dart frog or the Phyllobates ter uh, terribilis, they are toxic enough to where if it is in, uh, ingested or um, exposed to your bloodstream, it can kill a grown man probably three times over. Those are the dart frogs that were traditionally used by the natives of South America for their poison arrow darts for hunting, which hence the name poison dart frog. But not a lot of people do know that they can't actually naturally produce their poison. So they have to go through a, bio, a process of bioaccumulation to get their toxin, which means that um, in the wild, they would be eating venomous small animals like ants and spiders, um, and their body will take that toxin from that animal that they eat and replicate it to do their own, for their own purposes. So uh, our frogs have been born and bred in captivity. They've never had a venomous animal in their life. We feed them harmless fruit flies and crickets if they're being good. And so theoretically, our frogs are not toxic. They are not poisonous. However, since we are close to the rainforest at the Butterfly Center, some things can get in. We've never had that happen before, but we always handle them with caution because if they even eat just one ant or one spider, their body will replicate that toxin and they will be toxic for the rest of their lives. Now, some dart frogs can be so toxic where one drop of their poison could probably kill a grown man three times over, but some of them, if you touch it, you're fine, but if you lick it, which is never advisable, you'll probably have uh, mild stomach cramps. So it just depends on the species of frogs. Um, and here, uh, we do not have any overtly deadly frogs, or if they were in the wild, we would not have any deadly frogs. But again, we always handle them with care and caution. We have to feed them about 30 to 50 food items a day. So these frogs do get a lot of food. Uh, we also add a little bit of vitamin powders to make up for the lack of food as well. Um, and when BioDude came here, uh, they did add isopods and springtails uh, into the ground or the dirt mix 
So that way um, we gave it a chance to, or we gave them a chance to propagate and they always have food accessible to them. Okay, so I'm going to be feeding the frogs some flightless fruit flies. So we do get those ordered uh, from offsite. They get shipped to us and we just put them in a small container and dump them in. So while the frogs do have a bunch of isopods and little critters in there that the Bio dude provided, we still want to provide them their other diet daily so that way they don't get too aggressive or they don't get really hungry because dart frogs do like to eat a lot. So I'm just letting them know that food is here. Oh, and I see one already. So I will be dumping some in the back. I've got a couple feeding stations in here so that way they can at least find food somewhere. And then I'm gonna go through the top so I could dump the food up front. So uh, we do have to feed them live food because amphibians are sight-based predators. So they have to see it moving. So a lot of times uh, for our bigger frogs downstairs, if we're feeding them like worms and the worms aren't very wiggly, we have to take tongs and move the worms around so the frogs will start getting triggered to eat. So the fro dart frogs, since they are small, they get small food, like small pinhead crickets or flightless fruit flies, and they always have to be alive. Um, and again, flightless, so that way we don't have just a swarm of fruit flies coming out, and that way the frogs will be able to catch them easier. That is how we feed and take care of our frogs. We always usually make sure that they've got plenty of water, which they do. Make sure that our new Mist King Mister that the bio uh, dude installed for us is running, uh, and I have it set to run three times a day. And um, since the bio dude came, we can pretty much, will not ignore the tank, but we don't have to worry about it as much as we used to when we had the whole sump system. Now we don't have to worry about anything overflowing or anything drying out. We don't have to come up here three times a day to mist it ourselves. Thanks again to bio dude for coming out here and totally renovating our tank. It's beautiful and we love it. Um, please be sure to check out the bio dude's website, uh, biodude.com to see some of the wonderful things they have and possibly buy some things from them. And while you're here checking out our beautiful tank, please be sure to check out the rainforest and our insects do upstairs.